days, either here or somewhere south of that. And I recommend you get it because we're, we're going to be looking at some comparisons between HEVC and H.264. You're not going to be able to see it so well on the screen. So if you download the PDF file, you'll be able to see it pretty well. So here's our agenda. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what is HEVC because you know, I think pretty much everybody understands what it is and what the promise is. Um, going to look at the status of it from an encode decode standpoint. I'm um, going to look at the market status of the key, um, key market segments I think HEVC enables. Going to look at the royalty issue, which I think is one of the biggest issues that are you know, really hindering the uh, widespread usage of HEVC. And then I'll make some rough guesses about where I think HEVC is going to go in the short term. Um, Briefly, HGVC is the standards-based successor to H.264. Um, it got first stage approval, which means it's cleared for release and sale in January of 2013. Um, at a really high level, the key benefits are should deliver the same quality as H.264 to 50% data rate savings. So what does that do for you? Number one, it can cut your bandwidth costs. And number two, it can let you get HD video to locations you couldn't get to before because the bandwidth requirements were too high. So two benefits of the, of the data rate savings. And it also enables ultra high definition videos up to 4K um, to the extent that there are 4K videos and 4K TVs and, and all that. But we'll, we'll cover that later. There are technical links at the end of the article. If you want to see some of the techniques and technologies that are used in HEVC, you'll be able to you know, find links to that at the end of the article. I'm not going in there. I'm not going there in this story because I think you know, that's been told. So when I looked at HEVC, you know, I've been following it since January. I never got to see an HEVC encoded file until, you know, a few days ago. So the big question in my mind was, you know, how good is it? How does it compare to H.264? And the other question, of course, is, well, what does it take to play it back? Because if it's great quality, but you need a, you know, a 24-core computer to play it back, then it's kind of useless. So those were the, those are the really two big questions in my mind. Uh, that I brought to this presentation. And I was fortunate that Rovi was able to prepare some HEVC encodes using my standards test files. So I've used these test files for years. I know which frames look good. I know what they look like in H.264. And Rovi downloaded those files and then encoded files at various bit rates for me in HEVC. So we'll look at some comparisons of that in a second. I focused on two scenarios, 720p and 1080p, because I don't have a 4K test file, and also because I think the bandwidth savings is, is, is a lot more closer to being harvested than, the, than the, 4, the 4K video idea. So the big question, you know, does HEBC deliver the same quality 50% data rate? That was the big question for me. So I wanted to, you know, the handout is available on streaminglearningcenter.com. I recommend you download it because, you know, you're going to see some frame comparisons. It's going to be, you'll see something up here, but it'll be better if you can look at the PDF file itself. So the first comparison for me was 720p. So this is a 720p test file. And, you know, I wanted to look and see, does HEVC at 400 kilobits per second deliver the same quality as H.264 at 800 kilobits a second? Now, ESPN and YouTube distribute their 720p video at 2.5 megabits per second. So why did I encode it 800 kilobits per second? Because at 2.5 megabits per second, or 2.5 megabits per second, everything looks good. You're not going to see any differentiation. So since the promise of HEVC is bandwidth savings, I mean, let's see how low it can go. And that was, you know, that's the focus of this one. This is a 720p comparison frame. Um, my wife has a ballet company. I shoot a lot of ballets. A lot of ballets are in my test footage. This is a very high motion scene from Capellia, the dancer is panning across the stage, I'm following her with my camera. So we've got a mix of high motion and detail on the lower right hand side. So the, the, the little section you're going to be looking at is that little highlighted section. And it's HEVC, as, as the slide says, is 400 kilobits on the left. And I just wanted to put a 400 kilobit per second comparison with H.264 to show that there was a dramatic difference in terms of overall quality between HEVC at 400 kilobits per second and H.264 at 400 kilobits per second. I wanted to kind of establish that. So we're going to look at a couple of those. Now we look at HEVC at 400 kilobits per second and H.264 at 800 kilobits per second. And this little trophy up here is my way of saying, you know, which frame I think won. Um, try and keep things simple and visual, you know. Um, so 
When I look at these two frames, and when you look at them in your PDF file, I think you'll see that they're pretty much the equivalent, but I, I would give a slight edge to HEVC at 400 kilobits per second. So again, what we're looking at are you know, two files, this one encoded HEVC at 400 kilobits per second, this one H.264 at twice the data rate, and I think the quality here is slightly better. This is just one frame, one section of a, you know, a seven section test file. Let's look at some others. So here's, is it? Uh, 2997. Um, so this is another, here's a section I compared out of this big frame. And this one's closer. You know, I don't really, so I put this trophy in the middle here because I really couldn't pick a winner. But just the fact that they're very close tells you that, okay, you know, maybe there's something to this claim that HEBC delivers 50% better bandwidth at the same quality. So again, this is H.264 at 800 kilobits per second, HEBC at 400 kilobits per second. And then here's another section um, from a bluegrass video. This is HEBC at 400. This is H.264 at 800. And I think this looks slightly better. So, you know, I think this is one instance, one particular sequence where HEBC didn't deliver um, the full 50% bandwidth benefit. And then this is a very low motion sequence. My test sequence has everything from very low to very high motion. And it, this is a talking head low motion sequence, and these two look pretty much the same. Right? So if you're doing news videos or talking head videos, there's a pretty good chance that even at 720p, HEBC can cut your bandwidth by 50% and deliver the same quality. So it's going to be seen, you know, it's going to be seen dependent, but if you're producing 720p content, there's a good chance that, you know, as soon as all the infrastructure is in place, you could cut your bandwidth cost, if that's a big cost for you, by up to 50% at 720p. You know, you're not going to get you know, if you're doing high motion videos, you may not see that entire benefit, but for low motion videos, I think you will. Now, what about at um, 1080p? At 1080p, I tested at 2 megabits per second for HEVC and 4 megabits per second for H.264. And to kind of put this in perspective, you know, there's a lot of 1080p podcasts from Hollywood delivered at around 4 megabits per second. So whereas my first encode was a very aggressive test case, I think this is much more of a realistic, this is what people are doing. This is how they're encoding their video when they're delivering it at uh, 1080p. Of course, Apple recommends uh, 8.5 megabits per second for 1080p and their TN2224. So, you know, I wanted to see what it looked like 2 megabits per second for HEBC and 4 for H.264. So it's a different test clip. Um, some of the clips were, were uh, clip art from ArcBeats, some were from other sources. The first comparison we're going to look at are these two school children from this particular frame. Again, start at 2 megabits per second for both HEVC and H.264, and we see that HEVC is clearly better at 2 megabits than H.264 at 2 megabits. So we see a clear advantage there. When we go to the 4 megabit per second clip for HEVC, I still think this clip looks better. So we have HEVC, at least in my view, delivering better quality 2 megabits per second than H.264 does at 4 megabits per second. And then a couple of other segments. You know, this is HEVC at 2, H.264 at 4. I think this one's slightly better. There's slightly less artifacts down here in this very high motion racing sequence. Um, this is a frame directly after a fade transition. So even though it looks like it's low motion, it's actually pretty high motion. And we see that HEVC over here at 2 megabits per second is perceptibly better quality than H.264 here at 4 megabits per second. So at 1080p, which, you know, you're giving HEVC a bigger, a bigger palette to work with. I think you can see 50% benefit. You know, we didn't see that at all frames at 720p, but I saw that at pretty much all frames in this test case at, um, at 1080p. So the big question I had in my mind, you know, everybody hears great things about these new codecs. Does it deliver the quality that it was supposed to? And my initial tests indicate that it really does. And that's, you know, that's pretty significant because typically it takes, you know, several years for, for this type of benefit to really develop. And now we could get it much quicker than that. So the second question is, where does it play? Right? I mean, it's nice that the quality's good, but, you know, what do you need to do to play it? And so I ran some tests. I've got some, I've got some old computers in my office, and I wanted to see, you know, how low, how low can we go with, um, 
with HEBC video. So we've got, a, I think this is one of the, this Dell Precision is one of the, one of the oldest dual core computers out there. I think I got this one in like 2005, 2006. And what I did was I played the video file and I looked at the CPU utilization in four test cases, H.264 at 720p, HEBC at 720p, and then H.264 at 1080p, and then HEBC at 1080p. And I wanted to see where did it fail. So my old, the oldest dual core computer in my office could play HEBC at 720p pretty easily. Um, an old, you know, it's, it's probably three or four years old. It's a, it's a Core 2 Duo, a step above the Core 2. It's a Mac, um, a MacBook Pro. It required 18% for 720p, 39% for 720p HEBC. So 720p played on all the computers that I tested which was another shock for me, because I had heard you know, estimates between five and, five and 10 times the, the, the decode horsepower requirements. On the other hand, on these two computers, even though 1080p and H.264 played very, very well, um, HEVC failed on those computers, basically just stopped playing. So it looks like 720p H.264 video from a playback perspective will play on virtually all computers out there that are still that are still being used. Uh, good question. VLC player. Um, but it looks like 1080p is going to is going to cause some problems. Um, and then this is what about the i7 based notebook? This is this is an i7 based HP notebook. And this played, you know, this is a four core, eight cores with HGT enabled, and it played, you know, here's, here's what it took to play the HEBC at 1080p, 21%. So very comfortable playing that back. And this is performance monitor. This is a, a utility that comes with Windows. It's kind of a, a very graphic way to look at the uh, CPU utilization. Here's the H.264 file, slightly under 20%, maybe a couple of peaks. Here's the HEBC file really not that different, right? I mean, really, once you get into, the, into multiple cores, you can get a pretty good result playing back. And then I'm going to pass this guy around. And these are HEVC clips at 720p and 1080p playing on this, uh, I guess it's, an, it's a Nexus, I think it's an A17 CPU. So it's, um, pass it around. I've got a, probably a mistake. So I'm going to put a 1080p video on here. Katy Perry, hope nobody minds. And, um, and the playback is impressive. And again, I hadn't, I really hadn't seen any of this. You know, I read about it, but I hadn't seen any of this um, until, until the last week preparing for this um, presentation. So I think from a, from a computer standpoint, I think you know, most really, you know, in the last two or three years when we look at four eight core computers, I think they can play 1080p video, maybe even higher. I think you'll need the latest generation of tablets um, in order to play that back. I don't think it's gonna play on an iPhone 4S. I don't know if it'll play on an iPhone 5 even. You know, I haven't run those tests, so. But you know, it's, it's playing fine on that tablet. I mean, it's, it's uh, and that's not a, you know, it's a competent tablet, but it's not a, you know, super exceptional performing one. The Multimedia Research Group estimates that there will be 2.4 billion HEBC capable devices by the end of this year. So what, is, what does that mean? I think that means all the computers that we just talked about, plus a lot of the most recent devices that we just talked about. But 2.4 billion HEBC capable devices. So what does all that mean from a, from a playback perspective? I think if you're streaming to computers, I think most computers, I mean, I don't know of how many, I don't know the statistics, but I doubt there's that many single core computers out there that we, that we, we really care about, outside of maybe some targeted markets like education or, or government or, or similar markets. But I think, you know, you can play 720p video, it looks like, on any computer that shipped after 2006, 2007. So that's a pretty big installed base. Um, 1080p, I think, is going to exclude a lot of older computers. Um, streaming to mobile, I'm guessing only the most recent generations will be able to play it, but you know, until we run the test, we won't know. 
until we run the test at lower resolutions, we won't know. And then if you're, if you're delivering to OTT, obviously OTT controls the playback platform so they can kind of configure in what they want. Um, but the bandwidth savings should be there at 720p and at 1080p. So what about the infrastructure? Now we know the, the quality side and the playback side. What about encode, decode? Um, I don't think encoding will be a bar to m any mainstream applications. You know, many vendors have announced and either shipping or close to shipping. Elemental, you know, they're here at the show. They've got live 4K uh, Progressive 30 for the Osaka Marathon. You know, so they're doing live 4K 30 frame per second video, um, which obviously means they can do, you know, 1080p, 720p um, live today. Thompson did a demonstration at the French Open. Rovi shipped DivX with, DV, with uh, HEBC encode and decode. And Telstream, who's also here at the show, says they're going to have HEBC encoding by, in Vantage by the end of the year. So I don't see the encode side as being a bar for, um, for any HEBC-related applications, except you know, this is in mainstream streaming. Obviously, if we're looking at uh, applications like video conferencing, where you need real-time encode and a chip, you know, I think that will take longer. But in terms of streaming, live video or video on demand, I don't think um, HEBC, I don't think the encode side is going to be a bar. What about the playback side? Um, you know, DivX10 shipped with HEBC decode in uh, September of 2013. Um, VLC player just shipped with HEBC this week. I think that's very significant. Um, very nice tool to have, you know, cross-platform plays HEBC. You know, that, that I did all my testing with that. On the other hand, the kind of the, the ubiquitous players, you know, we haven't heard anything from Adobe, we haven't heard anything from Apple, we haven't heard anything from Google, and um, you see my sentiment on when we think HEBC decode will be in HTML5. Um, no time soon. So what's holding things up? Um, really what's holding things up, and we have a gentleman here from MPEG LA, and we can all point fingers at him. Um, what's holding things up is that we don't know what, the, what it's going to cost to use HEVC. Um, pretty interesting. I mean, Roe v, is a, Roe v is a public company. I'm sure they plan to pay any HEVC royalties when they become due. VLC is owned by Videoland. They are a French company. They don't recognize patents, and they say, we're not going to pay anything. Well, they don't recognize software patents, and they say, we're just not paying. Um, nice article in CNET that I referred to in my streaming media article about this. Uh, you know, so, so the royalty issue is, is, is I don't want to say it's in flux, MPEG LA is, is not, you know, they're saying that there's a, a group coming. They're not telling us when it's going to be available other than to say it will be, it should formulate soon. There's no guarantees that it's going to um, have every member um, in there. But let me, let me just kind of put this in perspective. We're way ahead of where we were with H.264, right? You know, we saw that HEVC became a standard in January. We're already looking at licensing and saying, hey, where are the terms? If we look back at H.264, the spec was approved in 2003. Royalties were announced by MPEG LA with a cohesive royalty group. There were really nobody else was asserting rights in H.264 except for that royalty group in 2003, November 2003. And the first license in the streaming space was th two years later, right? So there was time for the spec to solidify, there was time for the group to solidify, there was time for the royalty policy to be set, and then we started using it in streaming. Um, and then, so QuickTime was in 2005, Adobe incorporated that into Flash in 2008, so it's five years later, and then Microsoft was six years later. So we saw a nice progression of use, you know, use in the streaming space. Um, the policies from H.264, which I'm going to talk about because I think it's probably a template for H.265. You know, nobody knows what the ultimate royalty will be like, but I'm guessing it will be similar. Um, the encoder, decoder, they pay, if you include encode for H.264, you pay a fee. A fee. If you uh, include decode, you pay a fee. And there's a, a per year cap of 6.5 million per company. Okay, so Adobe includes uh, decode and flash. Encode, decode, and flash media live encoder, and encode and Adobe Media Encoder, and they pay 6.5 million, right? So that's the cap, and that's how it's structured from an encode decode side. Publishers, if you're shipping, if you're charging subscriptions or pay per view for your video, and you you are above certain levels, there is an, there is a royalty for H.264. Um, if you're shipping free internet video, 
there is no royalty for H.264. Okay, and that was established three or four years ago, right around the time that um, Google announced WebM as, a, as an open source. I'm not saying there was any causation between Google announcing WebM and the um, H.264 being free in per perpetuity, but the timing was somewhat suspect. Um, anyway, what I'm reading between the lines and what I'm hearing from some people is a lot of the people who contributed to the H.264 patent group are saying, you know, ESPN's making billions of dollars in advertising revenue on H.264 video, and we're not getting a cent of it because it's free internet video. And all the networks are doing the same thing, and everybody who's shipping video on iPods and iPads are doing the same thing, and corporations using H.264 in their networks, and we're making them be more efficient. We're not getting any of that savings either. So I think there's a huge amount of, I don't want to say huge, I think there's some sentiment in the H.264 patent group that they, they left some money on the table. And there's a lot of those people in the HEBC patent group. So what does this all mean for the HEBC rollout? Um, again, the HEBC group is being formulated, and we expect, I am told that we expect finalization soon. And that's kind of, that was the operative word, soon. Um, it is unclear today if, if, um, if all IP owners will be represented. So there are a lot of people with, um, you know, who, who contributed to the HEBC, HEBC HEVC spec, and until we, that group is announced, we won't know if everybody is in there. And it could be, some of the earlier reports said there will be a patent group represented by MPEG LA, and there will be other rights holders who are going after royalties on their own. So when you use HEVC, you may have to pay a patent royalty to MPEG LA, and then you may have to address other companies as well. That's unclear. You know, it, it, it may not happen, but, but some articles have reported that that may happen. And Nokia, this is interesting, in, in uh, I want to say August, MPEG LA licensed the rights to H.264 technology to Google for VP8 and VP9, basically freeing um, Google to ship VP8 and VP9, VP9 without any H.264 claims for technology. One company didn't join that, and that was Nokia. And Nokia has, sold, has sued Google around the globe for, for H.264 violations in VP8 and VP9. So that tells me there's a chance Nokia may say, we're not going to join the patent group. We're going to do our own thing because we didn't get enough money from you know, what we got with H.264. All this is a long way of saying that the patent picture is very unclear at this point. Um, the patent and the royalty side. So what does this mean? What does this uncertainty mean? From an encoder-decoder perspective, I think, um, you know, I, th I think it's, Virtually assured there's going to be a royalty. If you're shipping HEV, encode, decode, you're going to pay a royalty. Um, if you're a publisher and you're shipping subscription pay-per-view, there's a royalty for H.264. I think there's going to be a royalty for, um, for HEVC. If you're shipping free internet video, there's no royalty for H.264. But I think if you're above a certain size, there's, a, there's at least a chance, and I'm thinking it's 90%, there's going to be a royalty for HEVC shipping for free internet video. Why? Because you know, a lot of these companies are making a lot of money, and the patent holders aren't getting any of that. So they're enabling all these companies to make advertising revenue, and they're not getting a share. And I think they will see HEBC as a time to, to kind of change that. If you're a smaller company, you know, my company, hundreds of streams a, a month, I don't think they're going to come after me. But I think if you're, if you're shipping, if you're making a lot of money off HEBC, I think the, uh, the patent group is going to want to get their share of it. And then I th you know, this is the total wild ass guess here. But you know, if you're a big corporation and you're using HEVC internally, I think there may be a chance that uh, the patent group would want to go after that as well. Total, total wild ass guess, but, but I'm thinking that's at least a possibility. So will, will HEV royalties spawn competition? You know, I don't think, I just don't have a lot of belief in VP9. You know, in, in markets like this, I think standards win. You know, H.264 won, HEVC and H.265 are gonna win or will win is one technology. So I don't see, I don't see VP9 as realistic um, in, the, in the general purpose streaming space. I think it should do well in conferencing and some submarkets like that, but I don't think it's gonna be a big deal in the streaming. So what, what is the impact of this uncertainty regarding the royalty status? I think the high-end encoding tools, I think the elementals, the telestreams, the you know, all the big companies who were here talking about their HEVC encoders, even though they 
don't know what the royalty is, they see it as a cost of doing business and they will pay it and they're going forward assuming it's gonna be reasonable. So I, I don't think that's slowing that down at all. Um, integrated circuits for encode, decode, you know, the, the, the chips that are gonna go in phones and mobile devices and video conferencing stations, I think they're thinking the same thing. There's gonna be a royalty, it's gonna be reasonable, we're gonna pay it. Um, on the playback side, I don't even think the lack of a known royalty policy is really affecting Apple, Adobe, and Google. I think they're figuring whatever the royalty is, we're gonna pay it. I just don't think they think there's a big enough demand for it. I mean, if I can put off paying six and a half million dollars for a year, I'll do it. There's not enough HEVC content out there streaming for Adobe to say, well, we need it in our Flash player tomorrow. But I think when it, when it does become necessary, I, I don't think the lack of a known royalty structure will stop them. I think they'll say, it's gonna be reasonable, we'll pay the cost, you know, let's move the market forward. Um, and, and I'm guessing, you know, I'm guessing we'll know the royalty policy by March 2014. That strikes me as soon. And I'm guessing that soon after that we'll hear, we'll hear uh, the plans from the three companies that really kind of control streaming playback in, in computer and in mobile space. So I, I don't think the lack of a known royalty policy is really slowing things down on the infrastructure side, encode, decode. I don't think that's slowing things down at all. But if you're a content publisher, and, and the primary benefit of HEVC is bandwidth savings, how can you say, I wanna implement HEVC to harvest these bandwidth savings when you don't know if there's going to be a royalty? Okay, so I think, I think from a content side, you'd have to be crazy, you know, if you're ESPN or you're ABC, to start using HEVC without knowing what the royalty structure is going to be like. Because if it, you know, H.264 is free. And so even if you save a lot of bandwidth costs, if you're paying a royalty, that may erode the entire benefit. So I think this is where the lack of a known royalty status is really hurting the market. Not the infrastructure side, but in the, in the publishing side. And again, I'm guessing we'll know something by March, maybe June 2014 at the latest. So that's kind of the, you know, all that was kind of the bandwidth saving side. It's like HEVC is gonna save save a lot of people money in terms of bandwidth. You know, that remains to be seen given the royalty structure. Now let's look at the UHD side, the um, ultra high definition video. I just, you know, this is, I don't see this as a huge market in the streaming space over the next few years. I don't think there's, you know, there's not a lot of content. There's not a lot of viewing platforms. I mean, this is one analyst display search who's saying there's going to be, um, you know, 3 million by January 2015, 3 million 4K TV sets. So I don't, you know, in the general purpose streaming space, I don't see, I don't see ultra high definition video as being a significant driver for HEVC. Um, you know, there is, there is some content, films obviously can, can be rescanned. Not a lot of TV being currently shot in 4K and, you know, I don't think it's a good investment to spend a lot of money on a 4K set to watch upscale 1080p content. I don't think a lot of people are gonna do that. So I'm not a big believer in 4K market development. Some very smart people disagree with me. Um, but you know, if I'm thinking about HEVC going forward, I'm thinking more on the bandwidth saving side than I am you know, the ability to distribute 4K content. So where, where do we see HEVC appearing first? You know, I think it's gonna be in closed system where uh, one party controls both encoder and player. Uh, where the savings are significant and clearly evident. So we're talking things like primary distribution of television or OTT, where you're sending from the studio to the local affiliate, both sides use HEVC, you cut your bandwidth costs significantly, and then you transcode to H.264 or MPEG-2 um, at the local affiliate to deliver to the existing set-top boxes. So I see that as one of the first markets where HEVC could, could be useful. Um, New IPTV and OTT installations, again, they control encode, decode side. I, I see that as being a pretty good market as opposed to general purpose streaming. Um, once silicon is available for real-time encode at, at 1080p or, or uh, 720p, I see it being a boon in, in high-end telepresence systems where the bandwidth savings are pretty clear and the systems are expensive, so the royalty can pretty, uh, pre, be pretty easily absorbed. Um, in terms of general purpose streaming, you know, again, I'm thinking March to June 2014, we'll know what the royalties look like. Then I see HEBC decode and the general purpose players in the, you know, hopefully by the second quarter, third quarter next year. And then once we know if there will be a content royalty and what that might be, 
then I would expect to see some utilization in the streaming space around the December 2014 timeframe. So that's kind of my best guess of, of, um, of how I see things rolling out. If I am a video distributor at this time and bandwidth is a major cost factor, I think it's, rel it's clear that HEVC can save you a lot of money in bandwidth costs. We don't know what the royalty side is, but it will save you a lot of money in bandwidth. So what I do is I, I look at your content, I get an HEVC en encoder, you know, there's a free DivX encoder, you can use that. There'll be a lot of he HEVC encoding available in the next, you know, three to six months. Make some tests to make sure that you get the savings. You know, do, do you get the same results that I do? Do you see 50% on the video that you're currently streaming today? Run some playback tests, make sure that the videos play on your target platforms, and basically see if HEBC is going to deliver that kind of benefit from a bandwidth cost perspective. Um, and if bandwidth isn't a major cost factor, then you know, I don't see HEBC being a significant benefit to you anytime in the in in the foreseeable future, right? If you're you might as well keep using H.264 until, you know, and, and for the for for the foreseeable future anyway. Um, these are the resources I talked about. So if you're looking for technical resources, this article here should be pretty effective. Um, and then a bunch of other resources about some of the discrete topics that I talked about. Any questions? Well, hang on, let me, let me do the right thing here. Hang on. How do I turn this thing on? Anybody? Don't take a picture of me fumbling with this, please. That's, you didn't know how to turn on a microphone. Did you? Okay. I think that's so. The, if, if we didn't get that, the question is how does that? How do I see HEBC impacting workflows? And that's that's that was the big gap I was thinking. You know, I don't know. I think th I've asked people, can you create an adaptive group of files that has HEBC at the top end and H.264 at the bottom end? And I've heard that you can't do that. So I think you I think you really are looking at two different two different complete encoding cycles for HEBC and for H.264. And then, then we need to look at, okay, well, what's the benefit of HEBC at 640 by 360 at 1.2 1, 1 megabits per second? You know, basically at the lower file iteration. So it's a good question. That remains to be seen. For the 720p side-by-side -side comparisons and 1080p side-by-side, -side, it was Rovi on both sides, correct? Good question. It was, it was main concept on both sides. Okay. And it, but I did the, the H.264 encode. Okay. Thank you, Jan, for your great presentation. <laughs> I'm sad you didn't mention harmonic, but that's okay. We can, we can pass on that. I think you, you missed one important point, which is the transport. You didn't mention MPEG Dash as uh, one way to carry HEVC. And back to your question, can we mix and match H264 and HEVC? The answer is yes. And this is being discussed in the Dash industry forum. Okay, good. I, I had asked that question to a CTO of one of the vendors who was producing HEBC, and he told me no. So, but again, I think once HEBC gets closer, we need to flesh out those. You know, it's not like Dash is here on every desktop today. So just because it's possible in Dash doesn't mean it's possible to use in the general streaming space. Again, we'll see, you know, Dash is a whole other topic. Don't want to go there. Let's stick to HEBC. Any other questions? Oh boy. Do you want, do you want me to comment on HEVC? Uh, is this, this is the gentleman from, uh, from MPEG LA. Do you want to hear what he has? Yeah, I definitely want to hear what he has to say. Here, I'll, I'll stand by you in case anybody throws yeah. me down. Uh, I'm Bill Gary. I'm with MPEG LA. I'm putting together the HEVC uh, patent board, you know, assuming we can put it together. Um, we, uh, uh, 
and I also happen to work on the ABC patent pool, and so have pretty familiar with the companies and the history. Um, ABC did not include all of the companies in the patent pool. Nokia was not in there. Um, as you know, Motorola was not in there. That's part of their lawsuit against Microsoft or some of the ABC royalties. So it's unlikely to have any pool that's going to include everyone. It's up to each company whether or not they decide to join. What we try to do is try to get as many companies in as possible and um, keep the royalties at some level that's reasonable. But, and because a lot of the companies who are in the pool also pay royalties, they have some incentive to try to keep them reasonable because they pay the same royalties as companies who aren't in the pool. But uh, right now we have 36 companies in the HEBC royalty discussions. Um, some of them are in with patent applications. Um, when the pool launches, there won't be 36. There'll be less than that, uh, in part because some of the patents have been issued and in part because the patent evaluations will determine whether or not the patents are really essential to HEBC. Um, you know, as tough as one-on-one -on -one negotiations are, I, I say the good news is we have 36 companies, the bad news is we have 36 companies, and it's like trying to herd cats to try to get them to agree. Um, we try to keep the license as simple as possible because it's easier for us. When you see complexities in the license, and, and ABC is way more complex than than it should have been, but the complexities are in there to address concerns of specific groups of companies who, who want to charge, say, content royalties on this or that. Uh, so uh, we're still working through the issues. Our next, uh, and actually we thought we were done last spring, but we're not. Our next meeting is in about three weeks, and uh, I'd love to say we'd be done then. We might be, but I don't know. You know, I think you know, soon is probably as good a phrase, and we had some discussion of it internally. You know, what one thought was early 2014, um, but if all these companies agree, or a critical mass of them agree at the next meeting um, in the middle of December, then then we will be done. And I hope it is. Well, there was there there was never any other companies charging royalties for H.264, was there? I mean, is there? Uh, yes. Sure, uh, Nokia didn't join the pool. So, so they were out there charging royalties. Motorola was. Oh, and I never knew that. Yeah, the, the Motorola Microsoft lawsuit, some of the patents involve ABC, and they had a big issue in court about standard essential patents and what's a, a brand, a fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory royalty. And the judge went through all this stuff and analysis and Motorola wanted this much, and Microsoft wanted to pay this much, and they looked at pool royalties and saw they were closer to what Microsoft was offering, and the judge used the pool royalties as some evidence of what's reasonable, but it's a whole lot less than what Motorola was uh, asking. Um, I think uh, Alcatel, actually was Lucent, had ABC patents. They, uh, um, they didn't join the pool. So they asserted against each company individually? Um, yeah. Anybody paying content royalties on free internet video for H.264? Uh, H.264? Yeah. Well, um, the, I mean, the, the companies that no, you're... No, no, and actually, and, and by the way, the, uh, the initial license for H.264 had free content. Yeah, but that was, it was free until 2011. Yeah, yeah. And then it was pushed back to 2015. And, and then Google introduced WebM yeah. and it was, and it, really, it really had nothing at all to do with no, that. No, no, I, I, it, like no, I no, said. No, I, don't, I don't mind saying that. Um, you know, it's a nice kind of conspiracy theory. People are still trying to yeah, figure out who killed Kennedy. But um, the, <laughs> the fact is that once the license was out there not collecting on free internet video, there's no way we could say, oh, now we're going to start collecting for it. I mean, that would have that would have upset a lot of people. Um, well, what's your, what are your comments on my estimates of... Uh, HEVC royalty being 90% for free internet video. You think that's likely? I mean, so I said I think there's a substantial likelihood that, HE, that the MPEG-LA license will have a royalty for free internet video. How likely do you think that will be? Um, I, you know, let me give you let me give you a personal view because the the deciders, the people who decide, are the companies who own the patents, not MPEG-LA. I doubt there will be any royalty on free internet video, but in the end, it's up to them. That's cool. Fair. And that would fair be that would be great. Yeah. I think that would really help things along. But yeah, yeah, and uh, and 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm, I'd love to say more. But I got okay. I mean, and I, I've worked for several years trying to put together a patent pool on LTE, 4G wireless stuff, and um, we had more than 20 companies, and eventually we didn't launch a pool because we didn't think we could get critical mass, and, and of course now companies are paying lawyers a whole lot of money to sue each other over that. So, um, uh, but I think HEBC, I think we will have a pool. Um, we've got a lot of companies in alignment, and some we're still trying to bang into position. Cool. Any other questions for Bill? Any other questions for me? Okay, thank you for your attention. Where's the paddle? Wait, nobody go anywhere. Where's the, uh, okay. <laughs>